Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Group David Mackay Memorial Lecture. I'm Rupert Blackstone, Chair of the Energy and Environment Sustainability Group. And the talk tonight is How Sustainable is Decarbonisation by Ian Arben. Now, could you please ask questions as you go along in the Ask a Question tab to the right hand side of your screen? It will run on the past 7.30 because we, I mean, originally uh, this is going to be a live event um, and we've had to shorten the program to, to fit in with the webinar constraints but, but and, and, and what's been advertised, but it, it, it can run on beyond 7.30. Um, and before, before we continue with the lecture and uh, before I introduce Ian, I'd like to pass on to Alice Bunn, our Chief Executive, who knew David Mackay. So uh, over to you, Alice, for, uh, for an introduction. Thank you. Um, thank you so much indeed, Rupert. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I was really, um, really, really touched, I think is the right word, to discover that the institution runs um, a lecture series uh, in memory of David Mackay. Um, because, yeah, I was at university with David for a while. We were both at the same uh, college, at Darwin College in Cambridge. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was really touched to know that you run a, a lecture in his honour. Um, and was delighted to be asked to say a few words. And then I thought, goodness me, I don't really know very much about <laughs> David's engineering contributions. Um, because as I say, we knew each other through college life. And um, actually, we knew each other through playing on the same ultimate Frisbee team. Um, so I'd just like to take the opportunity to share a few, a few anecdotes here because it might well give you a side of David that you didn't, didn't know before. So I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, the game of ultimate Frisbee. It's, um, it's pretty pacey, it's pretty competitive. It's a team sport of seven people playing on the sides of a football pitch. So there's quite a lot of running around. Um, and as I thought about this a little bit more, and as I thought about how David was um, as a teammate, as a, as a friend in college, um, actually, I was really reminded of the institution's values. And I think, albeit through the medium of Ultimate Frisbee, David really, really lived those values. So first of all, I'd never played Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, David had been at the college for a number of years and was a real stalwart of the team. Um, so he sort of co-opted me onto the team. And the first value that he absolutely demonstrated was his inclusivity. He was incredibly patient with novices like myself, um, incredibly generous in his time and spent a lot of time taking on new recruits into the team and being very generous with his um, training opportunities. So that value of inclusivity was definitely one that David demonstrated. He was also very innovative. It's a, it's a game a little bit like American football where you have these plays, um, set pieces if you like. Uh, and David was always very, very good at coming up with new set pieces to give us that, give us that edge in competition. Um, we played every week, but every now and again we'd have a tournament. Um, David was very, very committed in the need to eat properly in the run-up to these tournaments because you'd be playing several, several matches, typically, you know, seven or eight matches over a weekend. Uh, and again, we shared an innovative platform. Uh, David was convinced that Pasta was the, the, the solution to victory. Um, I'd recently spent quite a lot of time in Italy, so uh, we made a very good team in the kitchen too, uh, making sure that the whole team were uh, equipped with the right amount of pasta ahead of the competition. Um, and integrity. Um, as you will know more than most, um, David really, really lived his sustainability credentials. Uh, the only time where I ever felt mildly uncomfortable was the fact that I owned a car and David was always very, very polite and generous, but I, I could sense his slight disapproval that I owned a car. It was a very modest uh, mini metro previously owned by my gran. Um, but he was always very, very, um, as I say, full of integrity, always cycling where possible, always taking the train where possible. Every now and again, 
he could be persuaded to accept a lift in my car, but only if it was absolutely chock full. So only could it be just only could that car journey be justified if it was at least five people in my tiny mini metro. And as you know, David wasn't a short man, um, so he really contributed to that journey too. And and impact. Um, goodness me. After college, we did lose touch, but we did cross paths again during his time as Chief Scientific Advisor at DEC, um, when my career was taking me down uh, through a focus on climate change using uh, environmental observations from space to study climate change. So um, we did happily kind of reconvene then. And um, I was hoping to be able to show an image this evening because uh, full of integrity, after that meeting, he somehow managed to dig out several team photos and sent hard copies of these photos of teams uh, to me in the post, which was a very, very lovely reminder of David. So I will pause there. There wasn't a lot of engineering in my update, but I did um, feel very grateful for the opportunity to share some kind of personal memories of David. And I wish you a very successful and enjoyable lecture this evening, and I'll hand back to Rupert. Thank you very much, Alice. That's, it's, it's great to get the personal connection with David Mackay. And, uh, we all in the ESG have a huge amount of respect for not only his clarity of ideas in relation to sustainable engineering, but the way in which he communicated so clearly to, to people at all levels. And, and that's what we, we try and do. And, uh, and with that, I will pass on to Ian, who uh, is, is very good at that, and uh, Ian Arden's been involved in ESG and in fact was involved in setting up ESG at the beginning in 2000, uh, and he's going to give a further introduction uh, to, to what he sees as being relevant. He's going to talk about how sustainable is decarbonisation. Uh, Please, just to reiterate, put your questions in the panel to the right and we'll pick them up um, in, in just over between half an hour and 40 minutes time, about 30, just over 35 minutes we're expecting the presentation to, to last for. So uh, uh, over to you, Ian. Good evening. My name's Ian Arden. Um, I'm a uh, founder member and uh, past chair of the Energy Environment as Good evening. My name's Ian Arden. Um, I'm a uh, founder member and uh, past chair of the Energy Environment and Sustainability Group. And I want to thank my uh, colleagues for inviting me to give this David Mackay Memorial Lecture uh, on the subject of how sustainable is decarbonisation. Uh, I met David Mackay a couple of times, in fact, shared a platform with him a couple of times at the institution, um, but didn't know him well. So glad to have the uh, more personal introduction by our new chief executive, Alex Bunn. Subject uh, I want to talk to you about then uh, is uh, how sustainable is decarbonisation, and to um, introduce myself, um, I'm the unusual combination of a career businessman, chartered engineer, chartered environmentalist, and part-time academic. So I address this topic from much more than the viewpoint of a single vested interest. I've spent over 50 years in manufacturing industry, mostly in the UK, but also in the Netherlands, Germany, and the USA. I started as an apprentice and worked through many roles in industry before moving into senior corporate management as MD or chairman. The first such post being as managing director of Howden Compressors Limited in Glasgow in 1987. For most of those 50 years, I have supplied sophisticated engineered equipment into the energy industry, both fossil and renewable, around the globe, and know the sector very well. For the past 25 years, through engineered solutions, I have focused on delivering truly sustainable solutions in the fields of engineering, energy, and management. 
So as an introduction to the topic, back in 2007, I presented what may well have been the very first EESG annual lecture on the subject of doing the right thing right, energy and climate change, which was a commentary on the climate mitigation technologies proposed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, that we know as the IPCC in their fourth assessment report. This was based on my observations over many years that engineers can generally be relied upon to do things right, but often have little control over whether they are doing the right thing, since they normally have to follow whatever government requires them to do. Little seems to have changed in this respect over the past 14 years. In 2002, I had the great privilege of being appointed by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, to their Distinguished Lecturers Program to speak on the subject of renewable energy and sustainability on lecture tours, particularly across the United States. This was during George W. Bush's presidency and around the time that he famously opined that we need do nothing about global warming, technology will provide the answers. In the UK at that time, we rightly thought his attitude to be delusional. Yet nowadays, practically all of the solutions being proposed, especially by engineers, involve some kind of supply side technology. So are we now saying Bush got it right? Everyone nowadays is familiar with the 2015 Paris Agreement's ambitions for net zero greenhouse gas emissions, GHGs, by 2050, that was at COP21, which was confirmed by the recent Glasgow Climate Pact at COP26. We're also very familiar with the UK government's stated policy of net zero being achieved through a rather ill-defined process known as decarbonisation. But is the concept of decarbonisation adequate to do this, or is it just another form of greenwash? It is noteworthy that neither the Paris nor the Glasgow Agreement uses the terms carbon or decarbonisation in their text. Take the most relevant paragraph from the Glasgow Agreement as an example. Paragraph 22 says, recognizes that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C requires rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions. I've provided the highlights there, including reducing global carbon dioxide emissions by 45% by 2030 relative to the 2010 level and to net zero around mid-century, as well as deep reductions in other greenhouse gases. So we see a fairly precise language. If we want to follow the science regarding climate change, then we also must use the correct scientific language to achieve this, not develop some new kind of sloganeering. The great maxim, which I have followed closely for many years, is borrowed from the McKinsey Corporation. If you cannot define it, you cannot measure it. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. If we're serious about climate change mitigation and adaptation, we must first be clear regarding our definitions and methodology of achieving them. A couple of weeks ago, I was a discussion panelist at an IMACE railway division seminar to respond to the question, is decarbonisation enough to achieve net zero on the railway? I was struck by the response of one of Network Rail's sustainability experts, where he said, decarbonisation isn't enough. If we eliminate our emissions under our direct control as Network Rail, we only eliminate 3% of our impact. I think this precisely illustrates the point that we're making here and puts decarbonisation in its context. There's nothing wrong, of course, with trying to eliminate direct CO2 emissions, but this alone will in no way 
achieve the 2050 net zero targets, and government has to stop pretending that it will. One of my favorite quotations regarding definitions comes from British children's literature of the Victorian era, a guy called Lewis Carroll. And in his book, um, Through the Looking Glass, which was the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, uh, he said this, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Now, this problem, I think, is even more serious today, where changing the meaning of words is being used, perhaps deliberately, to obfuscate and to divert attention from our failure to make any real positive impact on climate change the intended goal. So let's start with clear definitions. First of all, definition of sustainability. Two of the original definitions. Um, first from uh, the Brundtland Report, which started it all in 1987, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And one I particularly like and have worked with for years, the engineer of the 21st century inquiry in 2000, says sustainability can best be defined as the capacity for continuance into the long-term future. Sustainability depends upon maintaining and where possible increasing our stocks of certain assets so that we manage to live off the income without depleting capital. Sustainable development is the process by which over time we succeed in managing all the different capital flows in our economies on a genuinely sustainable basis. We do not have time today for a proper discourse on sustainability, but for many years of teaching the subject at master's degree level in UK universities, the most important aspects of sustainability in action are shown to be, first, the use of sustainable materials and fluids of all, type, of all kinds. Secondly, use and supply of sustainable energy of all types. And third, sustainable action or behavior in all cases. Over the past 20 years, in the UK at least, we have made a little progress with the use of sustainable materials and some progress with sustainable energy supply, although extremely little with sustainable energy demand. Sustainable behavior is still sadly a largely unknown concept. Ultimately, Sustainability is about the ability to see the big picture. Most of us, perhaps especially engineers, have specialisms and detailed knowledge of componentry, but often lack the ability to see how our part operates within the whole machine or process system. Even those who do rarely have the experience of how the machine or process interfaces with and impacts on its greater environment much less on the whole ecosystem within which we all live. This is particularly appropriate for the energy industry, where our traditional focus has been on the efficiency and impact of a small component of the machine or process system, rather than on the whole system, environment, and ecosystems. A classic example of this is the continued design of thermal power stations, from which we utilize a relatively small amount of the thermal energy as electricity, but waste most of it to atmosphere and water courses, which is clearly unsustainable. I would also have to say it's pretty poor engineering as well. These definitions are entirely consistent with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, of 2015, but are not reflected at all in recent UK government energy and environment policy. For example, the 10-point plan or the 2020 Energy White Paper, which are almost entirely focused on more nebulous concepts such 
as decarbonisation and net zero. It remains to be seen whether these concepts will make much difference to sustainability or climate change mitigation, but neither envisages any real reduction in energy demand other than by further offshoring of the UK's manufacturing industries. Much the same can be said of the May 2021 IEA report, Net Zero by 2050, which also relies heavily on decarbonisation and has little to say on the subject of sustainability. It even treats phrases such as zero greenhouse gas emissions, zero CO2 emissions, and zero emissions synonymously, which is absurd. So a definition of carbon and related issues. First of all, in my view, carbon is not the problem. Contrary to current popular belief that the answer to all our problems is to demonize carbon, this is also manifestly absurd. A basic understanding of chemistry shows us that carbon is a solid with a molar mass of 12. It is one of the basic building blocks of our planet and is the basis of all organic chemistry. Similarly, we human beings have a high proportion of carbon in our chemical composition, around 18.5% by mass. It would be impossible for life on Earth to exist without carbon. Carbon is the main component of sugars, proteins, fats, DNA, muscle tissue, pretty much everything in our bodies. So a zero carbon future that we sometimes hear about does not bode well either for us humans or for the planet. So carbon dioxide is not the problem either. Many people use carbon as an abbreviation for carbon dioxide but this is also extremely misleading. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a gas with a molar mass of 44. That's 12 for carbon plus 16 plus 16 for two oxygen atoms. Since carbon has a molar mass of 12, any confusion of the two will result in any values being wrong by a factor of 2.4. And believe me, I see evidence of this all the time. Uh, it raises the question, would anybody hire an engineer who couldn't tell the difference between an inch and a centimeter? The difference is about the same. Carbon and CO2 are very different chemically and they behave in radically different ways. Unlike carbon, CO2 can be, can be emitted uh, to the atmosphere where it acts as one of the so-called greenhouse gases, GHGs. These are not technically pollutants, although they're often called that, but even in very small quantities, parts per million by volume, have a very serious effect on global warming and climate change through the greenhouse effect. So what is the greenhouse effect? We don't have time to go through this in detail, but in the diagram on the left, you can see the solar radiation coming from the sun to warm the earth. Uh, and it passes through a layer of gases in the atmosphere called the greenhouse gases or the greenhouse. Uh, and this means that of all the uh, radiation um, that comes, reaches through to the earth's surface, um, much is radiated back into the atmosphere, but some proportion of it is actually trapped on the Earth's surface by the greenhouse layer. This means that the Earth's surface remains much warmer than it otherwise would have been. So the greenhouse effect is also not a bad thing. Without the greenhouse effect, life on Earth, at least as we know it, would not exist. The problem is, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we have simply been producing too large a quantity of greenhouse gases. Uh, and this is what has disturbed the pre-existing balance and given us the problem that we have today. In order, Earth's most abundant greenhouse gases are water vapor, 
carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and chlorofluorocarbons. Worth noting that water vapor, which is by far the most abundant greenhouse gas, is often not recognized by most people as even being a greenhouse gas. When these gases are ranked by their contribution to the greenhouse effect, the most important are water vapor, which contributes 36 to 72%, carbon dioxide, 9 to 26%, methane, which contributes 4 to 9%, and ozone, which contributes 3 to 7%. However, each of the greenhouse gases also has other different aspects. For example, CO2 remains in the atmosphere for over a century. So believe it or not, the emissions, all those terrible emissions from World War I are still with us. They haven't disappeared yet. While methane CH4 has something like 30 times the global warming potential GWP of CO2. So obviously very significant. From this data, it's difficult to understand why governments and NGOs have become fixated on CO2 or even carbon, as they confusingly call it, alone. This is unlikely, this focus is unlikely to have any significant effect on climate change. And looking at Greta Thunberg's zero carbon voyage in 2019 across the Atlantic, Greta and her crew are human beings comprising high quantities of carbon who emitted carbon dioxide throughout the voyage. Their very expensive boat was almost entirely made from carbon fiber. So while it was a commendably low emissions voyage, it was not remotely zero carbon. We need to get much more precise if we want to seriously deal with the problem. So I promised I would say something about COP26 and this uh, my own personal impressions of some of the highs and lows of that event. As expected, um, by me anyway, little was really achieved by COP26 despite the phenomenal quantity of greenhouse gases emitted by people traveling to and fro and the costly security presence, uh, the emissions from which will remain in the atmosphere for the rest of the century. It's not a transient event. The event slogan, keeping 1.5 alive, was clever, but was in no way matched by the published outcomes of the conference. These, in my view, will not get us anywhere close to the 1.5 Celsius maximum. However, I have a degree of sympathy with international governments. They want to be re-elected and simply cannot sign up to unpopular policies which would uh, prevent this. Greta Thunberg uh, continually described COP26 as just blah, blah, blah. But to be honest, I found her comments and those of Extinction Rebellion were pretty much blah, blah, blah as well. No one was coming up with any realistic, practical solutions. Protesting is not doing. The one protest group for whom I had a degree of sympathy were the Insulate Britain people. They at least were proposing one of the very important solutions where the UK lags far behind most developed nations. But using superglue as your way of achieving this is hardly sustainable. Overall, we could have done with far fewer people telling us what the problems are. Some of us have known about this for 30 years and far more people offering genuine solutions. Nevertheless, for me, the lowest point of the event came on the 2nd of November when Boris Johnson, in what he presumably thought was a clever speech, stated, as we look at the green industrial revolution that is now needed around the world, we in the developed world must recognize the special responsibility to help everybody else to do it, because it was here in Glasgow 250 years ago that James Watt came up with a machine 
that was powered by steam that was produced by burning coal. And yes, my friends, we have brought you to the very place where the doomsday device began to tick. You can just imagine Boris saying that, can't you, if you didn't hear him. I was interviewed by the Sunday Times regarding this statement, and they published an article with my rebuttal along with others uh, from other colleagues on the 7th of November. As many of you will already have realized, the Prime Minister's statement was almost entirely factually, historically, and ethically wrong. Uh, I don't particularly want to bash the Prime Minister. He's had enough of that recently, but he really ought to get it right. First of all, James Watt did not invent the steam engine. That happened many years before Watt. Nor was it the doomsday device, as he calls it, invented in Glasgow. Secondly, many of the early steam engines used renewable firewood, what we would nowadays call biomass, uh, as fuel, not coal. The use of coal did not come from engineers, but because from business people, because it was more cost effective. So it had nothing to do with what, really. And in any case, Watt's main contribution was to massively improve the efficiency of the engine by introducing a separate condenser. This is what engineers are supposed, supposed to do. And it was this colossal improvement in efficiency that made his development uh, one of the catalysts for the Industrial Revolution, which followed. But this is a classic example of the technical illiteracy which marks this government and is typical of their dismissal of the crucial role that engineers must play in developing viable, sustainable solutions. However, to end on a more cheerful note, the absolute high point for me uh, of COP26 came the following evening with the premiere of the Energy Institute's inspiring new film the challenge of our time, which has been made entirely by EI's young members, contrasting sharply with the prevarication of governments on the one hand and the pointless protesting on the other. This showed how young engineers have become motivated by the climate crisis to break out of traditional technology molds and embrace new and exciting ways of doing energy in the future. On numerous occasions, they highlighted the absolute necessity of changing our behaviors, not merely developing new technologies. Please watch this film. I hope it inspires you as much as it has me. I want to move on now to something called the energy hierarchy, uh, which was developed within the Energy Environment Sustainability Group of uh, I'm a key to specifically address some of these issues. So the concept of an energy hierarchy was first developed within the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in the early 2000s and publicly launched at ICOMES in Brussels in 2007. Following widespread endorsement from other international engineering institutions, it was published as an I'm a key policy statement in 2009. The 2009 publication argued that the government's sustainable energy goals were unlikely to be achieved by a focus solely on improvements to supply side technologies and that a greater focus was necessary on energy demand reduction, energy efficiency and behavior change. A decade on, little of this had happened and goals have not been reached. The energy hierarchy was updated and relaunched in 2020 and now needs to be implemented to achieve the new 2050 net zero greenhouse gas emissions goals. On the left of this side, you see the diagram from, uh, from, from the energy hierarchy, and it shows five tiers, um, with tier one being energy demand reduction, tier two energy efficiency, etc., down to tier five, utilization of conventional resources as we do now. 
these go from the least sustainable at the bottom to the most sustainable at the top. And it's a simple concept, but has profound outcomes. The energy hierarchy follows the rule that a kilowatt or kilowatt hour saved is more valuable, um, whichever way you look at it, than a kilowatt or kilowatt hour produced, no matter by what means. Similarly, the higher up the hierarchy we go, the more sustainable the process. So just to flesh that out a bit, how it works, tier one energy demand reduction, do not use as much energy, as simple as that. Tier two, energy efficiency, find more efficient ways of supplying using energy. I just want to point out there that um, energy efficiency and energy demand reduction are not the same thing, which is why we have specifically split them out in the energy hierarchy. They require different methodologies to achieve them. And it, it really concerns me and has done for many years that any document you see uh, from government and other bodies tends to lump the two together, which means they haven't fully understood the difference. But moving on, uh, tier three, renewable sustainable energy resources. That is the lowest environmental impact. Fourth, other low greenhouse gas emitting energy resources, though those supply sources which tend to reduce greenhouse gases rather than increase them. Um, and finally, conventional energy resources the way we currently do it. Now, I could spend a lot of time fleshing that out, but I don't have time today. Um, but you, you will see that what we're basically saying is that the focus on technology as being the solution simply doesn't meet um, the energy hierarchy's demands because technology doesn't get you that far up. Even renewable technologies are not the, uh, the total answer. Um, but moving on, um, just looking at that first tier, because it's the one that's most neglected by most people. First tier of the hierarchy, energy demand reduction, is a demand side measure, which often requires lifestyle change, but has the greatest, quickest impact on demand reduction and greenhouse gas emissions. It should be obvious that a greater impact can be made by saving a kilowatt or kilowatt hour of energy than finding a better, cleaner way of producing a kilowatt or kilowatt hour of energy. This concept is also known as the negawatt, uh, a term coined by Emery Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute in 1990, or more simply, the watt you don't use. Generally, examples of this are using all forms of motorized transport less, insulating buildings better, massive, passive solar and low emissions building design, turning thermostats down, avoiding travel by holding virtual meetings and conferences, etc. The key component here is sustainable action, which for most of us will require behavior change. Before COVID-19, this was considered almost impossible to implement in developed societies such as in Europe, yet now we can all see the benefits, particularly environmental, that have ensued. So if the first four tiers of the energy hierarchy can be successfully implemented, then it follows that the fifth tier, that is doing what we currently still do, but perhaps a little bit better, need never take place and existing forms of power generation, space heating of buildings and fueling of motor vehicles can eventually be phased out. This also means that continued exploitation of finite reserves, especially fossil fuels, will decline and will become much less of a strategic issue. The energy hierarchy is freely downloadable from the IMACE website. I give you the instructions there to access it. 
So to conclude, a way forward for net zero. For the past 200 years or so, the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, the UK, along with many other countries, has had a policy of trying to reach strategic energy objectives by focusing almost exclusively on supply side technologies. Unlike most other Northern European countries, little thought has ever been given to reducing energy demand to make energy supply objectives more readily achievable. Since 1990, when the IPCC's first assessment started to make us all aware of the need to mitigate and or adapt to climate change, the UK's energy goals and targets have become increasingly more based on sustainability goals. But despite this, the proposed methodology of achieving those goals has remained firmly with a so-called greener, cleaner supply side. Making efforts to reduce energy demand has not met with any success. Consequently, the UK's 10% renewable electricity by 2010 target was not achieved. The 10% renewable transport energy and 12% renewable heat energy by 2020 targets were also badly missed. Yet despite this poor track record, virtually all of the measures that are being proposed to achieve the 2050 net zero greenhouse gas emissions targets are also supply side technologies with only slight improvements over what has gone before. This does not augur well. To paraphrase GK Chesterton, it is not that energy demand reduction has been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. This is because a prerequisite of energy demand reduction is human behavior change. Unless each of us, we can't wait for governments and multinational corporations to do this for us. Unless each of us changes the way we live, we will go on trying to consume more and more energy. Many years of lecturing on this subject, I have been fairly consistently told that human behavior change is just too difficult for people in the developed world to embrace. However, the present COVID-19 crisis has changed all of that. Behavior change has been forced upon us and the results have been amazing. Energy consumption in the UK was down to levels not seen since the 1960s. Globally, climate scientists are saying that 2020 will see the lowest recorded greenhouse gas emissions in decades. If nothing else positive comes out of this terrible pandemic, let us make sure that the new normal after the crisis is over does not simply revert to our old energy wasteful ways. Following the principles of the energy hierarchy, for example, will help us to ensure that our world will indeed be a cleaner, greener place for our children and grandchildren to live. Following quotation is apt. It comes from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring of 1962, which I reread during lockdown. Um, Humankind is challenged as it has never been challenged before to prove its maturity and its mastery, not of nature, but of itself. If we are serious about achieving the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, it will require behavior change. We cannot rely solely on supply side technologies. The principles of sustainable behavior are commended to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Ian, for that excellent presentation. You uh, gave us a good guide as to appropriate use of technology, what to focus on and uh, helped us understand that we shouldn't be relying on technology uh, for the solutions to our, our climate change problems. Uh, we've got a few questions to answer and more are coming in. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with um, one or two here about the, the definitions and when we're going back to the, the terminology, uh, there was a suggestion by 
uh, Mark Edwards of Arcadis that the, the use of carbon is merely used as a shorthand for greenhouse gas emissions. No serious sustainability professional is suggesting that carbon should be eliminated. Um, and then one from Rebecca Taylor of Scottish Government Environmental uh, Policy, she's the Environmental Policy Advisor. Worth remembering that government doesn't fixate on CO2, but CO2 equivalent for the basket of GHGs, and it reports on that basis. So, um, Ian, please, could you just address those points uh, which differ in terms of the way people see the technology being used and, and, and how it's misrepresented? Well, yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the, those points. Uh, I am, of course, very well aware of that. Um, the, the point I'm making is after many years of experience on the subject, I see enormous confusion, not among, uh, particularly among experts, uh, but among uh, ordinary people who don't understand the difference between these things. And my simple comment there would be, why continue to use the wrong definition when you can use the right one? It's not difficult. Uh, so that was the point I was making. Why confuse the issue? Sure. That, thanks, Ian. I want to hear from Owen Davies, who's our retired IMECI mentor and, and PRI panellist. Owen says, if, if I was in government in a developing nation, I might well view decarbonisation as a potential threat to the integrity of the nation. My vaccine experience would tell me just how long it was going to take for the trickle down of technology to support marine, air and heavy goods vehicle transport. And all the while, hydro hydrocarbon based fuel and plant will become scarcer and more costly. If I can't maintain communications and mobility and the delivery of safety and security to my population, then it is likely that fragmentation and civil unrest will follow. This will in turn accelerate the migration we see already. Is anyone thinking about how we can accelerate the transfer of technology to make the transition a peaceful one? It's an aspect of sustainability we perhaps shouldn't lose sight of. I, yeah, well, that's a, a very good uh, question, and uh, if only we knew the answer to that, um, it would be a, diff a different world. Um, I, I think that the uh, the problem is that we uh, people in developing countries are following what we have done traditionally in the developed world, um, uh, and the simple fact is that we, having paid no attention at all to sustainability in the developed world, have been doing it wrong. That's the point I was trying to make. Um, and so they have copied us doing it wrong again. So it's very difficult now for us to say to them, well, OK, we now understand that we didn't get it right, but now you've got to stop doing it because uh, uh, that, that's just simply too hard. Uh, I. I a great deal of sympathy with developing nations in that respect, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation. But uh, no, there are certainly no easy answers. But unless we can get uh, change in the developing world, there is just no way that we're going to meet the targets that are being set. And that's what I meant about a mismatch between um, the targets that are being set and the methodology that we're proposing to get there. Thank you, Ian. Next one's from Andy Pearson of Star Refrigeration. Hi, Ian. Thanks for the talk. Do you think that the apparent need for the public to be given information boiled down to single number metrics makes sustainability unachievable? Um, Yes, Andy, broadly I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, um, I think there's too much dumbing down uh, and I think we just need to, uh, to, to have much uh, clearer um, statements on, uh, on what is going on and not try and come up with different language that we think 
people will understand better because my experience is it just it just confuses them yeah thank you uh, question from ian borthwick director of INR borthwick to me reduction of use of fossil fuels is a commendable target because we were going to run out anyway is it okay to develop green hydrogen solutions for instance with less focus on efficiency Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the the the, the sequence of that question. Um, yes, well, my, my interpretation was that um, Ian was suggesting we've also got to be careful about use of result constrained resources, possibly, and, and that hydrogen could be viewed as as wasteful. It, it, or certain green hydrogen solutions. So we, I, I think he's saying we need to be thinking about efficiency, but I'm not. I'm not is that a fair interpretation? Yeah. Um, I, I think um, perhaps it's the the connection between fossil fuels and green hydrogen that I didn't quite understand. But um, uh, the uh, yes, the, it's absolutely right that we need to. Um, stop using fossil fuels uh, and uh, green hydrogen is one way of doing that um, uh, because it uses renewable sources. Um, however, there are a very large number of issues with, uh, with hydrogen. Uh, I, I happen to have been working with uh, hydrogen for over 50 years, so uh, I'm very aware of the problems. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't develop hydrogen and see what we can do with it, but um, I think it's a bit dangerous if we simply assume that it's going to be the solution to the problem. Sure. Uh, next one from Thibaut Tan. One of the projects promoted in the EI video challenge of our time was of a carbon capture facility. Could you please comment on the role of such plants? Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, well, it, it, it's a difficult one because I, I, again, I have quite a bit of experience of, uh, of CCS systems um, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a good idea. Um, but the problem is that uh, it, it's being used to uh, to, to support the continued use of fossil fuels, that's its that's its main purpose. Um, so, in sustainability terms, we would have to look at uh, uh, at the real practical usefulness of CCS systems in achieving the end goal. Um, I'm not saying that, a, that it's a wrong thing to do. I'm just saying I think people again are, are using it as a sort of cheap get out of get jail free card rather than thinking through the ramifications of what it might mean. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got a couple here on behavior change. Mark Edwards has, okay, this is, has pointed out that the Committee on Climate Change has clearly indicated that behavior change is fundamental to achieving the UK's 2050 target, whether the government chooses to take this advice is another matter. And John Chappell of Regen Fuels has said that given that behaviour change is so important to achieving the 2050 target, what are your thoughts and suggestions on how to achieve this key change in behaviour, given that it is likely to be a difficult political nettle to grasp? So maybe you could comment on whether you um, think that it's adequately covered in the committee climate change recommendations and then the political challenges well, we, that are being questioned here. Yes, I, I didn't mention the committee for climate change, um, so uh, it's interesting that that has come up. The fact is that uh, in the uh, May 2019 document that the CCC produced, they didn't consider climate change, uh, behavior change at all, um, but made out that it could be achieved, the goals could be achieved by existing technologies. Um, and it was not until 
considerably later, sometime last year, that they said, yes, it will be a combination of technology and climate change. So uh, I was delighted by that because perhaps climate they change. were listening after all. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, yes, I think there is a growing understanding. I, I'm uh, seeing uh, conference beers being set up um, all the time just in the last few months that are looking at behavior change. And that is really, really good. But the point I was making is that in uh, ESG and IMAKE, we've been talking about this for well over a decade. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's both encouraging but also sad um, that people are just now starting to recognize the importance of it. Uh, as to its sellability, exceedingly hard to sell, um, which is why I guess nobody has wanted to touch it before. Um, but I don't see, personally, I don't see any way we're going to achieve the targets without, uh, without a strong element of behavior change. So somehow we've got to find out what, the, uh, what will make it attractive to a much broader audience. Thanks, Ian. Well, while we're on the subject of behaviour change, there's there's one from Mark Scanlon, uh, Energy Institute head of uh, HSME Good Practice, regarding behaviour change for energy demand reduction. Are there options to address different cohorts in the spectrum from energy intensive users through to individual domestic customers? Oh, of of, of course there are, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, the the energy hierarchy document is is a very broad high level um, uh, approach, uh, and we've always recognised um, that it, it, it to, to practically work it through uh, the energy hierarchy needs to be developed for every sector, industrial, domestic, different. Uh, applications because the the practical working out of it will be different in each case um, so yes absolutely thank you there's another one from Ian Borthwick here director of INR Borthwick why was not population reduction negative growth uh, population reduction and or negative growth economics mentioned um, well, population growth is most certainly uh, mentioned in the energy hierarchy document. Uh, I just didn't have time to talk about it tonight. Okay. Uh, as the this this from Alexa uh, Charisi of Max Gordon, as the grid decarbonises, uh, energy delivered has a lower CO two footprint than before. However, excessive measures to reduce energy demand, e.g. triple glazed windows, will have a much greater impact in terms of embodied carbon compared to good but not as high performing alternative, e.g. double glazed windows. Can we say that there is a limit to energy demand reduction because other factors come into play, e.g. embodied carbon and materials? Well, yes, of course, that's correct. Yes, I, I, I was... Uh... I, I, w I was merely um, using the, the uh, broad brush illustrations. Yeah, there are many, many factors that have to be taken into consideration if we want to achieve energy demand reduction. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one from Francis Murphy from iGEM. Is it possible to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere? Um, there's a great deal being talked about it over the years. It's not a it's not a new idea. Um, I'm not aware of anybody who's done it very successfully at the moment, or uh, in a way that would be commercially viable. Um, so while I, it, it's certainly a very attractive idea. Um, it's difficult to know how realistic it is in uh, a commercial world. Thank you.
UK emissions, this is from Peter Barnett, Community Business Projects and in, uh, an Environmental Consultant. UK emissions are often referred back to 1990 levels as a baseline. This was an era when UK industry moved offshore to be displaced largely by a services industry. We are told that reshoring industry is better for the planet, but with attendant increases in emissions as an engineering profession, should we promote reshoring and maintaining a heavy industrial base? Uh, very good question. Um, uh, I, I introduced myself as having been involved in manufacturing industry for all of my career, so uh, I would love to see a stronger um, uh, UK uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, it's uh, sort of my DNA. However, um, one of the main reasons we uh, have offshored most of our manufacturing capability is because it has enabled us to not account for the emissions from that manufacturing in our statistics. Um, personally, I've always thought this is cheating, but nobody wants to uh, seems to want to change it. Um, and I think a good starting point so that we could make the correct assessment is to include back into the UK statistics the emissions from all of the outsourced products that we import back into the UK. I think that would be a good way of finding out what our real uh, emissions uh, responsibility is. Uh, and that would help us decide whether or not it would be feasible to uh, revitalize the UK manufacturing industry. Thank you. A, a couple here on uh, veganism. Does Ian have a view? This is uh, Christopher Bond, Sellafield uh, Strategy Manager. Does, it, does Ian have a viewpoint on the generation of methane by cattle versus the benefits of a vegan diet? Will a vegan lifestyle truly benefit the planet? Uh, and Chris is an ex-young member of the of technical strategy board at the IMACE. And there's another um, follow-up question from Christopher. Can we grow the raw materials required for a, a vegan diet? Um, well, th this is uh, one you and I have discussed on a number of occasions, Rupert. And, uh, yes, indeed. Probably, probably answer it better than I can cause since you're a vegetarian and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, strictly on the actually, uh, but I, I can. I, I think, uh, um, I, I think that uh, ultimately, I think veganism will be forced upon us by practicalities. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I wish it wasn't so, but I really do think that is where we will all end up mm. well if you i mean if you want me to give my view i think uh the, the life cycle environmental impact um in well greenhouse gas emissions terms are lower for a vegan diet but then it, it can be said that ruminants such as uh, cattle are uh, have evolved together with other species living in symbiosis and have become um, part of the biodiversity. I know where I live in, in uh, Stroud and Gloucestershire with a common, the, the, um, the cow slips and, and a certain orchid rely on the grazing by, by cattle. Um, so may, maybe there's a, there's a, a, it's a question of degree, it's just how much meat is sustainable um, and how our animals farmed or, or kept. But in general, um, my understanding is the uh, vegan diet has a far lower impact. Um, right. Next one from Bruce Duncan of Atkins. With all of the CO2 absorbed by trees over their entire lifetime released upon their death, what do you make of the sustainability of companies and government focusing on achieving net zero by planting trees? Yeah, 
th this is a very complex one uh, to which there there isn't an easy answer. Um, I, I can certainly understand the benefits of uh, uh, of planting trees to uh, to absorb um, CO2 during their lifetimes. Um, I think the the there are conflicting uh, or somewhat conflicting uh, views on how much of the CO2 is released um, from the tree at, at uh, the end of its life. Um, certainly a lot more is released if it's burnt than if uh, it's used as timber, for instance. Um, so uh, th there's not a, a simple answer to that. Um, but a much bigger problem uh, to me, rather than afforestation, is the continued deforestation um, uh, in in certain countries uh, uh, around the world, such as Brazil and Indonesia. And, and uh, uh, I think the the starting point has to be uh, cutting down on the deforestation before we get uh, on a massive scale uh, before we get to afforestation on a relatively small scale if we really want to um, address this problem quickly. Uh, that, as I know, is politically dynamite, so uh, uh, I'm not suggesting it's an easy solution, merely just what we need to do as a, as a global community. Thank you. One from Jason Collins Webb. Uh, of Wood PLC, addressing behaviour change and the complexity of measuring effects. Has anyone tried to quantify the global impact of COVID in terms of the explosion in use of video conferencing against the pre-COVID status quo, including the massive increase in demand in computing and networking power consumption? It may be that the gains may not have been that much, if at all. Sometimes action taken in the interests of reducing energy demand don't always achieve the desired outcome because we can't see the full picture of our impacts. I thought I might just add to that my own observation that I, I, over here, and, and I know it happens so much that uh, meetings are recorded, not just presentations which can be a benefit to people watching later, but just standard procedural meetings are being recorded and presumably kept on the cloud somewhere indefinitely. So there's a long-term uh, implication of data storage, isn't there, with the video conferencing potentially. But Ian, over to you. Yeah, uh, it's uh, to answer the question literally. No, I am not aware of uh, a study being done, um, uh, uh, but it would be very interesting to see it because uh, uh, without having that information, it's difficult to say. Um, I, I can only uh, I, I can only say how much uh, more beneficial it has been for me. Um, as I uh, have been able to cut down my hitherto heavy travel schedules uh, to reach far more people uh, in far more parts of the world than I've ever been able to do before. Um, so it's difficult to see for me how it could not be beneficial to do it virtually. Yes, thanks Ian. One from Nadia Mafidi. How important or helpful is the nuclear power plant in this mission? <laughs> it always crops up, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, the, I don't. Uh, I, I, nuclear power is, uh, I think, a subject uh, we need to park in this whole discussion because it, it has its proponents and it has its. Uh, uh, it has its uh, despisers, uh, uh, and I don't personally think that we're going to solve uh, a mid-21st century problem with a mid-20th century solution. I think it's a bit of a distraction. Thank you. Well, we, we, knew, we knew we were going to overrun a bit, but um, the, the questions of have uh, died down, and I, I think I'm just going to ask you one more here, Ian. 
and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, this one's from Grenville Gaskell. Given the reluctance of governments to focus on lifestyle behaviour change to achieve demand reduction for political reasons, how hopeful are you that the energy hierarchy will be widely adopted? Do you consider the main driver will come from citizens electing to make the required changes irrespective of governmental positioning? Yeah, a very interesting question. Um, well, I, I'm afraid the answer to the first one is uh, since the energy hierarchy has been uh, uh, around since uh, uh, 2009 and I was teaching it in universities before that, uh, I'd have to say that the, the take up has been fairly woeful, but uh, I'm certainly hoping that in its, uh, its relaunched um, capacity last year, um, that more people will start taking notice because I do passionately believe that this is part of the solution. It's not the sole solution, of course, but it's, it's a part of it. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I, I can only hope and pray that it will become uh, more widespread because I, I, I do believe that, uh, uh, that that is a major part of the solution. Um, well, thank you, Ian. Well, it remains uh, for me to give thanks, and Ian, first of all, thank you very much indeed, uh, not only for the excellent presentation, but for the, for the great answers to the questions. And and uh, and they were a really good set of questions. Thank thank you to all the audience because the presentation laid a foundation, and and we covered a lot of uh, different bases in the in the questions. Really, really uh, testing the ideas there, which which uh, Ian responded to very well and clearly, and 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 there are no easy answers to a lot of this, and, and part of it's just a process. But I I, I feel that we've uh, we've gone a long way in working through the process this evening, and um, I, we must all continue together, and and I hope we'll we'll see those of you or, or, or meet online, um, those of you who attended tonight again, um, please look out for our our webinars, the Energy Environment Sustainability Group webinars that we put on, uh, and, and also our next David Mackay Memorial Lecture next year, yet to be yet to be decided. Um, and, and thanks again to our Chief Executive of the IMEC E, Alice Bunn, for the, the, the great personal connection with, with David Mackay. Uh, so many thanks again to, to Ian and, um, and I wish all of you a, a, a happy uh, Christmas and festive break and uh, I'll say goodbye. Um, have a good evening.